Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of MHNR 2020. Um, tonight, we are talking about physical interventions in mental health. And if you go onto the Facebook page, you'll be able to look at the videos that we've uploaded in advance to give you some more info on um, the research that we'll be talking about this evening. However, we'll be covering that during the episode. So if you haven't had a chance to watch it, don't worry about it. Um, I'm here with my colleague, um, as usual, um, Nikki Lambert, who will be in the background tonight covering the social media. A um, few words about social media. We'll be running it the same as we do every week with MHTV. So um, if you're on Facebook, if you just head over to the Unite MHNA Facebook page and like the page, and um, it should appear on your live feed. There's a comments box there, and we'd love you to interact with us, ask any questions, comments, that kind of thing. You can also join us on Twitter. Um, you can join us on both if you want to. But on Twitter, um, just, just to say that we'll be using a different hashtag to our usual MHTV one. So if you're on Twitter, if you follow MHNR2020, Nikki will have a head down mostly tonight because she'll be looking at the social media feeds and feeding any questions in. So I'm going to hand over to Ben tonight, who's going to be presenting tonight's episode, and then we'll go over to our panellists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about the studies. Okay, Ben. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in uh, live or um, in a catch-up recording. Um, and welcome, everyone, to this second episode of MHNR 2020. Our our theme this evening uh, is physical interventions. Um, my name's Ben Hannigan. I, I work at Cardiff University. I'm a mental health nursing academic there. Uh, I'm a member of the International Mental Health Nursing Research Conference Organising Committee. And until the end of this year, I'm, uh, I'm chair of a group called uh, Mental Health Nurse Academics UK. So I'm going to facilitate or chair this evening's discussion. What that means is, I think if everything goes to plan, you'll hear a whole lot less of me than you will of our esteemed panellists, Michael and Jackie. So that's Brilliant. me. Brilliant. Um, shall we go over to Michael? Do you just want to introduce yourself, Michael, and say a little bit about um, why you're here tonight, I guess, and, um, and the study? Yeah, uh, so hi, everyone. My name's Michael Nash, and I'm a uh, lecture in mental health nursing in Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, and the study that I'm going to talk about uh, was undertaken in a, an acute mental health unit in Barcelona in Spain. And uh, myself and a colleague from Spain, uh, Alonso, we've looked at the use of mechanical restraint uh, for people uh, in acute behavioral distress. And we were interested in mental health nurses' experiences uh, uh, post-intervention. Uh, and that's what we're going to, uh, that's what I'm going to present tonight on behalf of uh, Alonso and myself. Yeah, it'd be great to hear. Um, I was watching the video earlier, and obviously it's a Spanish study, but there's yeah. lots of implications, isn't there, in terms of restrictive practice in this country as well. So um, we look forward to that. And over to Jackie, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and just say a few words. We'll come back to the study in more details in shortly. Hello, I'm, I'm Jackie White. I'm, I work at the University of Hull. I'm a mental health nurse, academic. Um, I actually lead mental health strategy for students at the university at the moment. So that's quite a big thing. And I'm going to talk about um, a systematic review that I've been doing with two other people, um, Steve Hemingway and Steve Louis from the University of Huddersfield. And we've been looking at obesity and the length of needles required to achieve penetration into muscle when you give an intramuscular injection. Yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's not something that, um, you know, certainly in my own practice that we were ever, ever taught about, you know, so it's really important, isn't it, that we're talking about this and thinking from a more skills-based perspective and mental health, because of course, you know, things are changing and um, particularly the focus on obesity is quite interesting, isn't it? Both in terms of mental health and the general population as well. Yeah, we're we we haven't just got one pandemic at the moment. We're it's yeah. said we're in the middle of an obesity pandemic too. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, Ben, shall we come over to you then? Yeah, so we, we, we've we done some theming of the abstracts that were submitted to MHNR 2020. And Michael and Jackie, we brought your two presentations in this discussion together under a theme of physical intervention. So doing things to the, to the body, if you like. And, and whilst I guess both your work, your presentation, what you'll discuss are about doing things to, to the body, beyond that, I guess, um, your, your work is quite different. So in mm -hmm. some respects, I guess, Jackie, with, your, with the two Steves <laughs> that you've worked with, you, you brought together evidence for something which is really quite familiar. It's an everyday but really important aspect of nursing work, so intramuscular injection administration. Michael, what you've explored is something which I'm I'm going to guess is much less familiar, certainly to people working in or using mental health services in the UK at least. Um, I mean, Vanessa, you made the point at the beginning in your introduction that Michael, your, your, yours is a study which involved interviews with Spanish mental health nurses, um, talking about their experiences of uh, mm -hmm. mechanical restraint. Um, and what we could do as a suggestion is, is, is perhaps invite each of you to just to talk through the backgrounds to what you've done. Um, so Jackie, um, and if, and then if we, if we move from kind of background to the methods, what, what was it that you did in the studies? And then we could, you could talk then about your findings and then maybe something about the implications of what do nurses and others take away from your research. Yeah. Um, kind of take home messages, if you like, and what what should the kind of next lines of inquiry be um, in your two respective areas? So, Jack, you've got you've got a long standing interest, haven't you, in intramuscular injection administration? You you've published guidelines on antipsychotic medication. Is that right? Yes, and we're in the sixth edition now that have just come out. Uh, I publish um, guide a guideline with Celia Feetum, who. Um, is a member of the College of Mental Health Pharmacists, um, a pharmacist from, from the, who worked at Aston in Birmingham, and we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I got really interested in this because I've always been interested in medication management, but what yeah. really sparked my interest was student nurses mm. coming to me and saying, oh, I've been with this mentor, and they said my injection practice was fine, and then mm. I changed placement, and the next mentor said I was doing it all wrong. Yeah. So I started doing some workshops for mentors, bringing them into the university and giving them equipment and asking them to demonstrate to me um, how to give an injection or mm -hmm. to demonstrate to each other and um, to come up with some principles. And that was fascinating because they were all doing different things. But in about, I had about 60 mentors through these workshops and nobody was doing anything wrong. Maybe one thing I saw. So, but it was all different, but the principles were there. So I got interested in it. And also because, you know, I'm a mental health nurse. I was taught to give an injection on an orange in 1983 mm. and then obviously patients. And nobody ever looked at my practice after I qualified. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a lot of ritual practice yeah. in, in, in terms of injections. I was taught to use a green needle. Mm. I had no idea what a green needle was. Me too, yeah. So, um, well, I mean, I've done a lot of um, workshops around the UK and, and most mental health nurses, to be honest, when I talk about this, they think the green needle refers to the length of the needle and it doesn't. It refers to the gauge, which is marked on the needle. Um, so green needles are 21 gauge, blue needles are 23 gauge and it's really confusing and it, yeah. I've traced it back and it, it goes, it comes from um, Victorian measurements of wire and it's the external diameter of the needle. It's the stubs gauge. And so the larger the gauge, the smaller the diameter. Okay. So green needles are actually available in lots of different lengths. Yeah. But people didn't seem to be ordering these through NHS supplies. We just had... Um, a one and a half inch needle usually in, in the clinic to go and select. And then when the new antipsychotics came out, they came in a pack. So mm -hmm. we had things like risperidone and now paliperidone, aripiprazole, um, olanzapine, long acting injections. They come in a pack 
And often there'll be a different needle that you can choose. And I remember when Respiridone first came out, it had a two inch needle and everybody went, oh, I'm not injecting that in anybody. Yeah. It's far too long. So I got really interested in it then. So that's the background, really. And, and Steve Hemingway and I have worked together for a long time trying to make medication management resources that work for students. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we set about to do this systematic review. Yeah, do you think there's a lot of um, underlying assumptions that lead back to the old culture of mental health, that we're mental health nurses and not physical health nurses. So this is what we need to learn and that's all we need to learn in terms of giving intramuscular injections and obviously things are, are starting to change. Because certainly, you know, when I did my training in the early 90s, there wasn't much emphasis at all. You know, you were shown how to give an intramuscular injection with a green needle or um, a blue one if somebody was underweight, as I was as I was told when I did my training. And that was kind of the end of it until, like you say, some of the newer drugs came on the market and, um, you know, sort of made us question um, our skills and what we need to know. And obviously a lot more emphasis now on on physical health and mental health seems to be changing. Um, do you think that that's got any bearing on any of this? I think so. And I, and I also think that this is all about our clinical judgment as mental yeah. health nurses. It's the one area where you just can't really have a checklist of things mm -hmm. to do. I mean, there aren't, there aren't areas, I don't think, in nursing where you can anyway. But that, that sort of drive to standardise and just to teach people and then they're somehow competent, when I really think you've got to, you've got to look at the individual. And we know that obesity is increasing in the general population and certainly in people with um, a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the chances are they're going to be obese. Yeah. So we need to think about that. Otherwise, and, and it worries me, where is this Where is this in medication going? We've all felt granulomas that are like nodules. That's where the medication's in the fat and it's becoming yeah. encapsulated. Yeah. And also people could end up on really high doses of medication when it's actually down to the technique of how the injection's given in the first place, isn't it? Absolutely. And then it's going to be variability if one practitioner gives the medication one month and... Um, somebody else the, the following month they've got different techniques there'll be variation in you know what the um what the person's receiving and it doesn't just apply to long-acting antipsychotic injections there's going to be a lot of interest in vaccination and there already is with um flu Im immunization but that these these vaccines are given intramuscularly mm -hmm. um there's also contraceptive injections they're injected into the gluteal muscle and if they're not being, if they're not being, if the technique's wrong there, maybe there's more risk of people becoming pregnant. But yeah. we don't know from the literature whether it actually impacts on, on these medications working, if we get them into the muscle or not. Yeah. Most studies are done in large numbers of people in America who are mostly obese. Mm. Wow. But it's um, so it's something I've just been it's a bit of a strange thing, I suppose, but I've been interested in it for some time. Yeah, no, it's great. And Ben, I think I introduced, <laughs> can't say the word, interrupted you before. Do you want to? Um, there's, want just, to there's, a, there's a particular word, Jackie, <laughs> that you use in your presentation, which yeah. is new to me. Um, it's the word lumen. Yes. Well, this is it. The other thing is that the nursing textbooks are really interesting because they tend to all refer back to um, an opinion piece written in the 90s. So even the nursing textbooks will state that the gauge is the internal diameter of the needle. And the word for that is lumen. So obviously you have an external diameter and an internal diameter. Mm. And the reason why it's important to understand that what we're looking at is the external examiner is in in some of the, diameter rather in some of the products that we now use that come in packs they have green needles there's a green needle but the internal diameter is much bigger giving a thinner wall to that needle yeah. so if you drop that needle on the floor you can't go and just pick out any green needle yeah from the clinic so so yeah but that's what the lumen is it's the internal diameter and clearly not all green needles are alike exactly 
My, Michael, how about you then? You've got so Jackie's talking about doing things to the body. You know, you have to touch somebody to give them an injection. There's there's hands to flesh, isn't there? You you yeah. you talk about physical interventions too, but a very different very di different kind of um, physical contact. And in your presentation, your video presentation, it helps a lot that you've got um, you have a a picture, a photograph, and it's a bed. I mean, it's it's a it's I mean, mm. people will see it and be shocked and surprised, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not something we're used to seeing in the UK. But but in order that we know what we're talking about and what it is that the nurses in your study were talking about their experiences of, what what is this thing, mechanical restraint? Right. If you if you imagine uh, in in it, uh, in the UK a seclusion room. So basically it's a seclusion room, but instead of uh, having maybe a mattress on the floor and everything uh, fixed to walls, what we have is a gurney bed, a bed that you would see in an accident emergency department. Uh, and wrapped around the center of that would be a very large, thick leather belt. Uh, and the person would be restrained to the bed using the belt uh, and then there would be anklets and wristlets. And those would be, again, thick leather. And they would be maybe sheepskin lined in order to prevent chafing uh, of the extremities uh, or even the person uh, engaging in self-harm. Uh, because it's not, a, as you say, it's a very, very severe form uh, of restrictive practice. Mm. And the reason, uh, the reason why I, I felt exactly the same when I was listening to Alonzo, uh, my colleague who we, we did the study together, and he was looking, he was presenting on the management of uh, acute behavioral disturbance or violence and aggression. And he had a really nice presentation, uh, but I noticed that seclusion wasn't mentioned in the, uh, as one of the restrictive practices in, mm -hmm. Uh, the management of acute behavioural disturbance. Uh, so when I was speaking to him about it, he had never heard of it. Uh, so for us in the UK and Ireland, we would be uh, quite aware and au fait with uh, the use of seclusion and physical restraint uh, as restrictive practices. Uh, less so, I think, with mechanical restraint, even though in some it has been used, um, it is mandated under uh, the Mental Health Act, but the, the use wouldn't certainly not be as high uh, as in Spain, because in Spain it would be used uh, as an alternative to seclusion, because seclusion wouldn't necessarily exist. Mm. So the, the idea that we had was to look at nurses' experiences and then try to use that as a way of trying to change practice. Yeah move away from mechanical restraint towards seclusion. But I, I had to explain to Alonzo that, uh, that in the UK and Ireland, Australia, you know, quite a few jurisdictions, we're, we're actually trying to move away from seclusion. So I think it's just, uh, I think it's just indicative that certain jurisdictions are the, the way in which uh, mental health nursing practice uh, is conducted uh, isn't may not be in some regards as advanced as uh, others. Should we should we press on and and invite you to talk, Michael, about the methods that you that you use, you know, your piece of research. And then Jackie, we could come back to you and ask you to talk about your systematic review. So Michael, you 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 conduct a piece of primary research, didn't you? So you you interviewed what a number of Spanish mental health nurses. How, tell us about that. So we, well, in, it was a Spanish study. So in Spain, there wasn't uh, a lot uh, actually uh, written about nurses' experiences uh, post use the use of mechanical restraints. So we adopted a qualitative descriptive approach, which is an approach that's used when very little is known about the area under investigation. And I suppose it's a way of, uh, doing a very broad study to see if there 
is indeed anything really worth investigating uh, at the end of the day. So it, it gave us a good broad uh, view of nurses' experiences. So we had 10 qualified mental health nurses who worked in uh, acute admissions uh, in a uh, hospital clinic in Barcelona. Uh, we advertised the, the study uh, using posters uh, and we were, because it was a small study, we were looking for eight to 10 people. We, we would have been happy with eight as a, as a small sample, but we got 10 uh, uh, qualified mental health nurses. And uh, we, we developed a, a 12 item interview schedule and that was taken from uh, a literature review. Uh, and again, there was very little literature on the use of uh, mechanical restraint. So what we were doing was we were looking at the use of things like seclusion and rapid tranquilization and trying to adapt some of the questions that were used in some of the interview schedules uh, that, that were published. Uh, and we came up with 12 questions and there was just a range of questions about uh, we asked people to explain uh, their most recent use of mechanical restraint, just so that we knew that they were actually involved in one. And then just getting people to speak about how they felt uh, during using it, how they felt after, how they think the service users felt, uh, institutional support, uh, how supported that they feel following it, and then the effects uh, of the use of mechanical restraint on the uh, nurse-patient relationship. Mm. Yeah, did you record? So you recorded the interviews, presumably, and then yeah. So the interviews, yeah. Sorry, the interviews were recorded. They were audio recorded and transcribed. Uh, and this was done in Spanish, so I, I speak Spanish, but Alonso transcribed, and then uh, I listened and transcribed. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I, I don't think the language barrier uh, was uh, very problematic. Uh, I also used uh, Google Translate as a means of assisting, but Alonso speaks good English as well. Mm -hmm. So I think between both of us, we uh, recorded 10 interviews. Each interview lasted between 45 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes. So there was a good, they, they were good long interviews. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, we did get a lot of data that we used uh, Braun and Clark's thematic analysis as a means of uh, analyzing uh, the raw data into themes. Mm. Yeah, um, before we sort of move on to, you know, the results of the research, we've got um, a question that might be good to bring in at this point from Nick McEwen, who obviously chaired last night's session and um, is involved with MHNR. And his question for Michael is, did the 1,200 uses of mechanical restraints in the UK involve bed restraints or straight jacket, or were they the use of handcuffs relating to escorting people out of secure units? So were the restraints related to transferring people between to secure units or were they in response to incident um, such as violence. Um, so yeah, that's his question. Yeah, I yeah I understand the question. The uh, in, in terms of looking at uh, why the the type of restraint and why it was used, that yeah. data that data is not uh, available in the report, and they do give Excel spreadsheets as well. So going through the spreadsheets, it was very hard to find why or how uh, the person was mechanically restrained. Uh, all there was was the was the bare statistic of the uh, 1,200 uh, usages, but that was in England. That wasn't in the UK. It's just confined to mental health services in England. So yeah. it could well be that they were mental health and intellectual disability services. Yeah. So all we have is the all we have is the number, uh, yeah. and then very little information uh, after that. Got potential there for. I think there's great potential. Uh, I mean, in Ireland, uh, the under the Mental Health Act and with the Mental Health Commission, uh, mechanical restraint is used, but I think the the use of it is extremely rare, uh, yeah. and it is very rigorously uh, monitored. 
in terms of uh, looking at the good practice guidance under the Mental Health Act. So I'm sure that uh, if someone was interested in tracking down the actual extent of mechanical restraint and indeed what, what form it undertakes, uh, that would be a very interesting project. Yeah, very. Yeah, that's great. And um, Nikki, you've got some questions for Jackie, I think, from social media. Do you want to come in at this point? Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's really hotting up tonight. So thank you very much, everybody. I've got my iPads around, <laughs> juggling back and forth. So, um, Katja Young says, um, "I thought we had a validated module, um, a model um, using a Z track um, that seems to work well." And then she also was talking about. Um, that many trusts have retractable needles now and they can be quite daunting because they're quite thick. She wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, a couple of comments about that. In terms of oh. Z tracking, I mean, there, there's there's different techniques that can be used and definitely the evidence is stronger for Z tracking. So that's what we should be using because the benefit of the Z track where you put some tension on the skin is that it prevents the, uh, the the medication from traveling back up the track where you've injected it and irritating the tissues. So it should reduce pain and it should help the medication to stay in the muscle. But what I was more interested in was whether it was getting into the muscle in the first place. So that's why I was looking at skin to muscle depth. Um, in terms of, sorry, what was the second thing? Tractables. Tractable needles. The problem with traumatizing. Yeah, the problem with retractable needles is my understanding is that it's not possible to order different lengths through NHS supplies. Mm. So in the guidance document that Celia and I have been updating and have just published, and, and all of them actually, we don't recommend retractable needles. Um, there's also needles that have um, a filter within them that are supposed to prevent shards of glass being drawn up into the yeah. injection. The problem with those are that the antipsychotic medication is such a long chain molecule, it gets stuck in the filter. So we mm. don't recommend those either. Mm. Yeah. It's a safety things don't really work for us. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a comment here, Annie Cox from Michael saying, um, thank you very much for your research. It's really important. We need to pull ourselves out of the dark ages. It's not really yeah. a question, more of a... A statement. Yeah. It's a very valid <laughs> statement as well. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a couple of students saying they didn't even realise that we did do um, restraint, mechanical restraint in this country. So I think that's really useful to clarify that as well. Mm -hmm. And then a couple more students saying how frightening um, injections are to give and to learn to give. And if you've got any advice on that, Jackie. Yeah, I mean, I remember meeting a third year adult nurse who'd managed to avoid giving injections because she was needle phobic. I think it's about exposure. And that's quite a difficult thing now because you might have to go to a number of placements before you get exposure to, to, to um, giving enough injections. So if there are any clinics happening, that would be my advice. It's about, it's about exposure to gain yeah. confidence, like with most things. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much, Vanessa and Ben. I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Ben, should we come over to you now? Yeah. Okay. So, Michael, you... you conducts a primary research study, haven't you? You've in, you and Alonso have interviewed 10 mental health nurses working in Barcelona. Jackie, yours is a different kind of study, isn't it? You, you've done something called a systematic review, is that right? Yes, so yes, a systematic review is really when you design almost the perfect study and then to answer your question and then you go out to try and find out where the evidence is. Is there any evidence to answer this question? So we were interested in skin to muscle depth and also um, obesity status. And it caused us some problems. I think it's often the case with systematic reviews that you have to keep coming back to make sure that what you're looking at is actually what you set out to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, had, we looked for anything where the distance from skin to muscle penetration had been measured. And, and that might have been done in a variety of ways, um, ultrasound, CT scans, MRI scans. Um, most of this research isn't conducted by nurses, it's radiographers or sonographers and people like this who do the research. Um, and they, we also needed to make sure that obesity status had been reported. 
So whether that using, um, you'd, I'd like to say a reliable and valid measure, the best measures we have are body mass index and hip to waist ratio. And those were the, those were the methods that we used in the papers we identified. And we went much broader than just looking for um, to, to relate it to antipsychotics. People were doing this research because they were interested in vaccines, immunization. But we looked at, at any study where um, the surface of the skin to the muscle had been measured um, by a medical test. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's that's what we look for. That's what we set out to look for. And when a, where obesity status had been reported in, in the subjects of that study. So is the world full of studies like this where you're completely inundated with... No, no, <laughs> no. We we identified thirteen studies, and one of those was there were two studies um, carried out by the same group, who was the only studies actually that had nurses involved. <laughs> so there were only thirteen in total. So that's thirteen studies in the English language published anywhere in the world. Yes and where um, where the subjects were 18 or over, because we wanted to exclude children and adolescents, um, because particularly adolescents have different um, distribution of body fat. Yeah. And um, um, were these, so when you looked at your 13 studies, were, were they all similar or were they quite Different. No, they were all quite different. They'd used um, different methods to for the medical test, although the most common one was ultrasound. They'd used different methods to measure the distance. They'd used lasers or they'd used um, digital calipers or somebody had got a picture out of the machine and used a, you know, used a ruler on it. So there were different ways of measuring it. Yeah. Um, and they'd been conducted... Um, um, in the UK, in the USA, Turkey, in different countries. Um, yeah, they were all quite different. And that meant that we couldn't really pull everything together. Mm. If we could have pulled everything together, we could have perhaps come up with a meta-analysis of what the mean distance is and whether it's different in, in people with different obesity status. But we couldn't do that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, um, I'm conscious that we've only got um, 15 minutes left. We seem to be flying through this tonight. So I wanted to just, if it's all right with you, Ben, come over to Nikki because I know she's got some more questions and then I think we maybe need to talk about um, the results and some yes. of the implications. Yeah. yeah, so um, Nikki, do you want to... It's, it's lovely. Everyone seems to be splitting their, their questions between you two guys, so both of you get ready. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of student anxiety, I would say, if my injection's coming through, which I completely get. Um, when trying to gain depth for an IM depo injection, how common is it to hit a bone or is that just a student nurse horror story? I think this is quite, um, it's uncommon. Mm. I think it's about the anxiety. Um, mm. I've never hit a bone. Mm. I have accidentally injected myself when given a demonstration, but that's another story. That's the sort of thing <laughs> lecturers do when they're trying to be clever and show off, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So, um, particularly in the current crisis, a lot of the people that we see, um, somebody has described on um, Twitter rather beautifully, beautifully as plump derrieres, but we're going to continue to call it the um, obesity crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Mick, um, I would be really interested to hear more about your work. Um, if I um, go back to your presentation, is your paper cited there so I can read more about it? There's so much opportunity to learn from research. That's Huddersfield Mental Health Nurses, such an important part of um, nurse and nurse training. So thank you very much, guys, for that. Um, did you want to say anything about how people can find out more about your findings, Michael? Uh, well, we're currently writing the, the study up for publication. And uh, I suppose that depends on whether uh, a journal will accept it. Uh, yeah. I, I, which is what one of the the one of the risks that you take. So, I mean, uh, I write it up, and I mean, I think people may have my email address. So, if it doesn't get published, it'll still I can still do a summary uh, mm -hmm. for people that are interested. And I think it's uh, well, I think the findings can be uh, 
transferable in some regards uh, when we look at the findings in a second, but I think that they, that they are transferable findings because the same may apply to other forms of restrictive practices. Yeah. Michael, press on. Tell us what you found, because yeah. Vanessa, you were you 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 made a right. very reminder the need to. This is what people want to hear, isn't it? What did yeah. you find in your study, Michael? Right. So for for our study, uh, we analysed the data and we came up with three broad themes. And the first theme that we the major theme that we that, that we had was that of uh, what we term symmetrical trauma. So when we asked uh, the mental health nurses how they felt. Uh, we were able to sort of characterize that uh, those feelings in a scale. So, uh, but it's not meant to be a quantitative scale with factors and stuff like that. It's just to, to characterize the emotions and the feelings. So we, we went from one, which was bad, two, impotent, three, very distressed, four, dire, and five, totally traumatized. So even though the intervention uh, is mandated and it is an inverted commas it's legal to use that, that did not make it any more palatable for mm -hmm. the for the nurses that, that, that had to use it so then we asked the nurses well how do you so you feel like that how do you think the service user feels uh, and they used exactly the same words uh, mm -hmm. for the service users so they, they felt that the service users felt bad up to totally traumatized yeah. So there was a symmetrical aspect to the trauma uh, that was experienced. And, and we thought that that was, it showed a great deal of uh, compassion and empathy for uh, the, the workers who have to uh, use these types of, you know, very paternal, you know, as someone said in the comments, a dark age practice. Mm -hmm. Our second uh, theme was moral injury. So a moral injury is basically a harm that's been done to someone's sense of personal values. Mm -hmm. So we thought that uh, from this uh, symmetrical trauma and the, the prejudicial effects of using an intervention, that maybe because people are nurses and their primary motivation is to care for people, that using interventions that are totally contrary to uh, what we're primarily there for caused a really big moral injury. Uh, mm -hmm. People felt very distressed uh, with that. So moral injury was the second theme. Uh, and I don't think it's surprising that the third theme was broken trust in terms of the effects on the nurse-patient relationship. The trust was, uh, we wouldn't characterize it as irreparably damaged. Uh, in, some, in some cases, it, it came very, very close. Uh, and people felt that there was a, a very, very big distance between the service user and the nurse or even the team because people may have come from other wards to, to assist. And uh, so trust was, was uh, very badly damaged. So there was a moral injury and then a fallout from that there was that the trust was broken. Mm -hmm. I think those findings are really powerful. Mm. And people have people have to see your presentation actually um, yeah. for people who haven't and yours as well jackie people who haven't had a chance to see your individual video presentations ahead of this discussion it's really yeah. important that people do so i think yeah um, um, share that again on the social media and you can access it on facebook as well but we'll share the link as well on twitter for people who've missed I just, sorry, I just wanted to say that even though it was with mechanical restraint, I still think uh, with using any type of restrictive practice, uh, especially for students and student nurses there who, who may not participate in it, but a moral injury, it, by definition, is you, you do not have to be a participant. You could be a witness or a bystander. So even if you're witnessing something uh, happening, uh, it, it, there's still a trauma that can be attached to that. So this mechanical restraint is quite brave, but uh, rapid tranquilization, physical restraint and seclusion uh, can give uh, mental health nurses a moral injury as well. Yeah. Mm. 
Jackie, what did you find in your systematic review? What we all found kind of- that in all 13 studies that we identified, there was a correlation between obesity and the distance from the surface of the skin to the muscle. Mm-hmm. And really importantly, in the gluteal site, so that's the dorso gluteal <laughs> site in the bottom that we most often use in the UK, and the thigh site, which is the same muscle, you just approach it from the side. Mm-hmm. Um, in women, um, it exceeded 37 millimetres. And the, the the green needle that all of us were taught to use was usually one and a half inches, which is about 38 millimetres. So it's unlikely in women that these injections are getting into the muscle unless we use um, a two-inch needle. Wow. So that's that's what we found. And also the deltoid and vastus lateralis site. So this is the deltoid is the, in the arm and the vastus lateralis is the outer aspect of the thigh. And in both those sites, the injection, the, the, the distance to muscle was not as, um, as, re, as related to the obesity. So you're more likely to get it into the muscle if you use those sites, if the medication license allows you to use those sites and they don't all allow that. Did you just say it was with the results were with women? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's particularly with women. Um, if a woman is um, obese or, or overweight, we should be using a two inch needle if yeah. we're using that gluteal site. And if they're um, overweight or obese, we should be making sure that we use a, lo- a long enough needle, e- even in the deltoid. The advantage of the deltoid is you can often see the extent of the fat pad. It's like a triangle and you can see it. And so you're more likely to be able to make a judgment. In the other sites, you can't really see so easily where the fat is and where the muscle is. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's really important, really significant, isn't it? So I, so I think, um, I mean, one of the key things I think is to make sure that there are a range of needle lengths available in the clinic if you're able to select one um, for the type of injection that we're using. And this also might have implications for other types of nursing practice. So there's been quite a bit of concern about um, auto injectors for anaphylaxis. There was that case of a girl on a plane on, who died, unfortunately, Natasha. And I think the coroner thought that the needle length had um, was related to that. Yeah. Now the jury's out on that a bit, I think, because when you when you inject somebody with an EpiPen, you depress the skin and also it shoots the injection towards the muscle, mm. so it has a much shorter needle. But it seems likely that manufacturers should be thinking more about obesity in terms of needle length that are supplied with products. Mm. And it might be relevant for vaccines as well. Well, it will be relevant for vaccines as well, if in women particularly, and in anybody who's obese. Mm. Mm. And where will people find information about your study? And um, Well, these are um, important findings, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, we haven't published it yet. And we made a bit of an error at the beginning and didn't um, register it with Prospero and I think we'll have some difficulty getting this published because we didn't register our protocol and we did it a while ago backwards and forwards busy people Mm. so I think we're going to um, I'm going to register it and repeat it because I know there's been some further studies published a very good one actually that shows that we shouldn't be using the rectus femoris which is the front of the thigh Mm. Um, so I want to repeat it But in terms of the latest evidence in here, I've incorporated it into the guidance document and that's available. It's on the linked on the last slide of the presentation with um, with two links, two separate places where you can get that from for free and download it. Yeah. Um, And also people are welcome to email me. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And um, Nikki, um, any questions on social media? everyone's everyone's just loving it just lots of liking and thanking and stuff like that so no questions at the moment but thanks very much i think people have learned a lot tonight actually i know i have yeah me too definitely have we have we got time to ask one more question of each i'm just i'm I'm really yeah i'm just 
Michael, are you satisfied that we've talked through um, in terms of the implications from your study as well? Or is there anything that we've missed that you want to mention? No, I, I, I think in terms of looking at the use of restrictive practices, uh, that if, if mental health nurses are going to be involved in restrictive practices, and I think that the mental health trusts and other organizations are going to have to think seriously about the uh, this concept of moral injury. Yeah. Uh, I think we just have to take it a lot more seriously, both yeah. for uh, the mental health nurses that may be involved with restrictive practices, but more so with service users, because not only is there a moral injury, there's also a physical, emotional, you know, and other other types of traumatic injuries as well. For, for service users, their families and their carers. So I think it would have to be taken a lot more seriously. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's something that isn't really talked about very much. I know we talked a little bit about moral injury in um, a previous session of MHTV, but not in connection with this subject. And as you say, it's really important. And we talk a lot about complex trauma, don't we? But we don't talk yeah. about complex trauma in relation to practitioners. So, yeah. yeah. Ben, did you say you had a question or was it just... What, you what, what, would, what's, what would be a really important next research study for both of you? you know, what's your, if this was a programme of research, what, what, Jackie, for you is the next most important study that has to be asked? And Michael, what's the next most important study for you? Hmm. I mean, I, I'm interested in changing practice. So I think it would be some sort of dare I say it, should I want to do one again, cluster randomised control trial where you educate nurses about this and then try and measure whether there's a difference in, in patients' outcomes. But that, I think that would be very complex because nobody has demonstrated if you inject into fat as opposed to muscle, if it's actually detrimental in terms of the medication. Well, that's the honest answer. Yeah. One, one of the studies they did this, they taught, um, we didn't look at that because we were just looking at the, the depth, but they did they did try and implement guidelines to see if it improved um, the injection getting into the muscle. So more of that sort of research, I think. Yeah, interventional research. Yes. Yeah. And I think the pharmaceutical industry should pay more attention to the differentiation of people with obesity in their trials. Yeah, definitely. And Michael, for you, what would be your your next? Our, our next our our next step uh, is we did have an ethics we did have a proposal uh, submitted to the ethics committee uh, in Barcelona to to look at doing a similar study, but from a service user perspective, the service user and family perspective looking at the impact of uh, mechanical restraint on them, but uh, something happened, I think COVID related maybe, uh, and everything is just up in the air at the minute. But our next our next stage would be to have a service user perspective on it. I mean, it's important that, uh, that we look at how healthcare workers are in relation to these themes and concepts, but I think the service user perspective is equally as important. The, the only inhibitor may be that it may be too traumatic for service users to, to yeah. talk about, and that may be a barrier in terms of seeking ethical approval, because if, it, if the ethics committee deems it to be maybe a little bit harmful, then uh, that would be one of the things that we're that well, we'll just have to wait and see. But yeah, getting service users' perspectives would be very important. I I think that's really interesting to hear. And certainly when, when I was looking at your presentation and hearing you talk today, where one of the questions that you ask your nurse participants was what did they think about service users' experiences? It absolutely occurred to me to do what you're suggesting to yeah. ask people. But you're quite right to mention all the all the ethical considerations that would attend to that. But that, that seems to be, to me, to be an, a, a next yeah. kind of inquiry for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, talked, we've talked about the fact that there was symmetry between 
um, you know, how nurses felt and how they felt that people who were experiencing the restraint felt. So it'd be good to see whether that married yeah. up with what people's actual experiences were. But I totally can see what you're saying around um, the sort of distress and people having to relive their experiences. Um, but I think your point as well earlier about, you know, I was making assumptions about whether people would prefer, um, you know, seclusion, restraint or um, other forms of restrictive practice if, you know, if we had to engage in any restrictive practice at all. And we yeah. do make assumptions, don't we, about what's the least distressing and, um, you know, certainly serve issues of perspective is, is what we need, isn't it, on that, right, really. Yeah, I mean, people will have rapid tranquilisation in their crisis plans that it's something that they that they want. Yeah. Sometimes. So, you know, yeah. there is that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're right yeah. about the assumptions, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's very probably very individual, isn't it, as well? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm conscious we're coming to the end. Um, in fact, we're running over a little bit because we've had such a detailed discussion, which is great. Um, I wondered if we should just go around um, with any final thoughts from everybody just to make sure everyone's had opportunity to say um, what they want to say tonight. So um, just looking on my screen and the order on my screen, should we start with Michael? Is there any sort of final um, take home comments that you want to make while we wrap up? No, I, I think uh when we, when as mental health nurses, when we get involved in restrictive practices, I think there's always going to be a challenge about rebuilding and restoring trust. And I think that's going to be uh, a continuing challenge mm -hmm. for uh, mental health nurses in terms of the nurse patient relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And then Jackie. Well, for me, it's about clinical judgment as, as nurses, as mental health nurses. We really need to think about the individuals and not assume just because we've been taught to do something in a certain way that we don't have to adapt it to meet the needs of the individual. So my take home message is making sure that, that we're not just following a ritual, that we look at the person yeah. um, before, we, before we select the needle for them. Yeah. That's great. And Nikki, and then I'll come over to Ben. Um, any final thoughts from you? You've Just had that I can't, I can't type and talk at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined in on social media, though. It's been a really lovely thing and everyone's been answering each other and it's been it's been really great across the platform. So thank you very much for that, guys. OK. And Ben, um, from yourself and also, I wondered if you wanted to say a few words about tomorrow and what we've got in store. So I, I'm going to begin by, in fact, this is all I'm going to say about tonight. I want to thank you, Michael. I want to thank you, Jackie, for talking about things. Actually, I know nothing about. Mm. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot, actually, um, through being part of this discussion. Um, and by the sounds of what, Nikki, you've been saying, monitoring social media, a lot of other people have found this really important and interesting have learned a lot too so big big thanks to you both uh, for taking part today shall i shall i say a little bit about tomorrow yeah um, yeah so we're on to episode three tomorrow and um we've got we've got a um we've got episode three and episode four actually tomorrow yeah mh and r 2020 so between half past six uh and um, seven o'clock tomorrow, we have me in conversation with uh, Russell Ashmore. So for people who don't know Russell, he is the International Mental Health Nurse and Research Conference historian. So mm -hmm. we're going to have a discussion. I think Russell has been to every conference mm -hmm. ever, um, every MHNR and NPNR, Network for Psychiatric Nurse and Research Conference that there's ever been. Um, so that'll be a really good conversation. I think it's got every book of abstracts from every conference too. Mm -hmm. And then we meet again at half past seven, between half past seven and half past eight. Michael, you're back with us again, aren't you? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm. And yeah. you're talking about mm -hmm. mental health awareness and training needs of Irish primary school teachers? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. We have a children and young people's uh, mental health theme so it'd be great to welcome you back, Michael. Beth Thunder uh, is going to talk about childhood adversity and psychosis. And then Rachel Bullock with co-author Anne Cox is talking about nurse prescribing and child and adolescent mental health services. So we're on to 
we're very much talking about children and young people tomorrow. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we'll leave it there. And thank you very much, both of you. It's been absolutely fascinating. And um, I felt quite stunned into silence at times listening to you. I mean, learned so much and um, be great to kind of follow the journey and, um, and just keep up to date, really, with any future developments. And it's just great, isn't it? I mean, just having this opportunity to bring this online this year, I think is fantastic to kind of widen the audience and allow mental health nurses and whoever else is interested out there to, to listen. So we'd encourage you all, if you're listening to us tonight, to, to stay tuned and join us tomorrow. And we're here all week and next week as well. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B